Good morning and welcome to a shortened version of the service that I've prepared for Airport West Uniting Church on this Sunday which recognises the baptism of Jesus. My name is the Reverend Judy Rigby. As we begin, let me acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians and traditional custodians of the lands in which we live, learn, work and worship and pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge the commitment of the Uniting Church to work for reconciliation and justice. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship. And if you want to respond to the words in the darker type, please feel free to do so. The heavens open. The spirit descends. Jesus emerges from the water and a voice echoes through the blue expanse. This is my child, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus is named, claimed. We come to the water. We remember we are named, claimed. Can it be so? What a thing to be named, claimed. Let us worship the one who names and claims us still.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we believe that you birthed a world out of love. You called light into being. You showered us with mercy and pronounced us beloved. But sometimes we forget your claims upon us. We hear the call of the psalmist to ascribe glory to your holy name, to worship you in holy splendour, to hear the voice of God as it resounds throughout the world. But sometimes we forget your claims upon us. The cool water streamed down the face of Christ and heavens parted and you, O God, announced your love. Gather us into that love today and help us to hear again your claims upon us, that we too will be touched by the cooling waters and be blessed with your peace. Amen. And hear the words of assurance. God's voice rings over mighty waters, shakes the wilderness, shatters the forests of Lebanon. God's voice splits the heaven. The spirit descends like a dove. An announcement is offered. You are the one I love dearly. You are the one in whom I delight. So I declare with great confidence, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to pause the video here and read the readings of the day. If you do this, you'll recognise that the prayers we've just prayed are based upon these readings. They include Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, Psalm 29, and the Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1, verses 4 rather, to 11. Retired Minister Catherine Matthews describes how when you enter the chapel of the National Offices of the United Church of Christ in the US, the first thing you encounter is a baptismal font, which has running water. She further describes how you can hear the churning waters throughout the chapel, even during a worship service, and especially during quiet, solitary reflection. The entrance to this place of prayer is designed to remind people of the baptism in which Christians share a common identity in Christ. Matthews goes on to talk about the responses she received when standing at that font with a group of visitors. She would ask them what associations water had for them in the life of faith. And I wonder if I was to ask you this question now, what your response would be. Matthews continues that youth groups often mentioned Noah first, not the happiest story about water. But invariably, the list included the waters at creation, the parting of the Red Sea, the water turned to wine at Cana, and of course, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. She would then refer to the universal experience of birth, when waters break and new life emerges, commenting that while this last example may seem unrelated to faith talk, Perhaps it is closer to baptism than any of the others because our stories about water have a kind of power and risk and drama. Our thirst for water is a more urgent need than hunger. We can last longer without food than water. No wonder water then has so much spiritual meaning. We conjure beautiful images of baptism or of God leading us beside still waters. But these are balanced by the images of raging waters. We hear the prophet declare that there will be times when we will pass through high waters and we will see disciples on the stormy sea with a sleeping Jesus in the boat. Images that must haunt 
survivors of natural disasters like tsunamis or hurricanes or floods. But these images of power and risk are not the ones we associate with the story of Jesus being baptised in the Jordan River. In our mind's eye, it's a nice scene. Jesus, uh, John rather, dipping Jesus beneath the waters of the river and Jesus hearing the voice of God from above, claiming him as God's beloved son. And then there's a sweet dove, the Holy Spirit, hovering over it all. A nice baptism of Jesus goes well with our own experience of baptising babies and even adults. A happy occasion, perhaps followed by a party, not one involving risk or danger or drama. However, even a little time spent with a text unsettles our comfortable assumptions and stirs up our imaginations. For example, If we look closely, the sky doesn't just open up, it's torn apart. How do you imagine a torn apart sky? And here's some possibilities. Notice that both light and darkness are needed. This is not an insignificant detail that Mark includes, that the skies are torn apart given that he only uses a few words to tell the whole story of Jesus' baptism. He's included this idea for a reason. And then he uses the same verb only once more to describe the temple curtain being torn apart when Jesus died. So that he describes this torn apart sky invokes the ancient cry of Isaiah, who when he observed a broken, alienated world in need of God's hand, prayed this prayer, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. You you may remember that we talked about this scripture on the first Sunday in Advent. Mark then is making it unmistakably clear that this story of Jesus is about God's activity The good news of God has come, but it's not a nice, gentle coming. He portrays this first public appearance of Jesus with a sense of power, risk and drama. Ripped open skies, troubled waters, and as one commentator describes, even a dive-bombing Holy Spirit. To balance this, however, The message Jesus hears is one of comfort, reassurance and kinship. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This moment of drama and visitation, in the midst of which Jesus hears God claim him as his son and call him beloved, no doubt would have served to comfort him in the days and years that followed, in the wilderness temptation, in the face of opposition from religious leaders and doubt from his followers, in the garden, at the trial, on the cross. When opposition to Protestant Reformation was at its height, reformer Martin Luther spent a year in exile for his own safety. These were lonely months, full of anxiety for Luther, in which he felt imprisoned. He reportedly inscribed on his desktop the words, I am baptised, and often came back to these words as he battled with despair. Later, he would passionately exhort others to remember your baptism. The invitation to remember our baptism is an invitation to seek equilibrium on a storm-tossed sea, to get our bearings, to remember who and whose we are, and to ground ourselves in that assurance. Luther wrote, A truly Christian life is nothing else than a daily baptism, once begun and ever to be continued. We are called to remember each day whose we are and how beloved 
we are. When we consider our own baptism in light of Jesus' baptism story, do we consider ourselves beloved? Do we think of ourselves of, as, as part of a community of the beloved? More than that, do we see ourselves as one with Jesus, a beloved community that brings healing to a broken and alienated world? Because that is what we are, beloved, united with Christ and one another in one fellowship of love, service, suffering and joy, in one family of the Father of all, in heaven, on earth and in the power of the one Spirit. Of course, many of us have no memories of our baptisms. Our parents presented us to be baptised when we were infants. In an attempt, therefore, to remember our baptism and think of it as an ongoing, continuing state, let me remind you of my favourite part of the infant baptism liturgy of the Uniting Church in Australia. And let it be an affirmation of our shared identity in Christ as the Beloved. Just before the, the infant is baptised, after the water has been poured, the minister, with baby in arms, says to him or her, and I invite you to hear these words to you today, for you, and I invite you to insert your name here, for you, Jesus Christ has come, has lived, has suffered, and died. For you, he uttered the cry, it is accomplished. For you, he triumphed over death and even before you were born. For you, he prays at God's right hand. In baptism, the word of the apostle is confirmed. We love because God first loved us. And so I say to you today, we have been baptised in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. And this next song is the song that we generally sing at, at, at the time of baptism.
come now to our prayers of the people. And there is a response for you when you hear me say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with hear our prayer. Let us pray to God who is made manifest in Jesus Christ. As the prophet Isaiah rang out, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Empower your church, O God, to ring out the good news of the light of your Son, Jesus, which pierces even the deepest darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As a star rose into the nighttime sky to draw the nations to the Christ child, send your blessing, O God, on this nation and every nation and draw the whole world to your peace and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As John the Baptist guided throngs of people to the edge of the wilderness and baptised Jesus in the River Jordan, we pray that you would guide our country and the countries across the world and our leaders to the ways of justice and righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Like the Magi who travelled from afar to bring gifts and celebrate the Saviour's birth, we pray for our faith community. Deepen our understanding of the Gospel Strengthen our commitment to follow the way of Christ and help us in the faith and communion of your church. Increase our compassion for others and send us into the world in witness to your love and bring us to the, full, to the fullness of your peace and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As Jesus climbed the mountaintop and proclaimed blessings on the people of the world, we pray for the sick and the distressed, the poor and the lame. And we pause to remember those we carry in our hearts for whom we would especially seek God's care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, light of the world, hear our prayers and make us reflections of your light, that the places of darkness in our world would be pierced by your light and that all nations would be drawn to you and be overwhelmed with your joy. Amen. And we gather this, the prayers that we have said both out loud and in our own hearts, and those prayers for which we can't yet give words to, into the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now may I bless you. Go now with the divine word in your ears, assuring you that you are God's beloved children. Live out the deep, truths of your baptism and tell others of the abundant life beyond the waters. And the spirit who hovered over the face of the waters at creation, at your birth and your baptism, grant you the gift of the freedom of Christ. In the name of God, who created you, who formed you and who loves you. Amen.
Just unto you and be gracious.